Hello, welcome to the latest episode of British History, Royals, Rebels and Romantics, the podcast for people who understand that history shows us what's possible for us in our lives today. I'm Carol Ann Lloyd, your host and tour guide as we travel back in time. We're shaking up history to look at the stories that don't always make the history books, to consider famous and infamous characters in new and interesting ways, and to look for all the things that we share, even when we're living in different times and places. I hope you enjoy this journey through the royals, rebels, and romantics of Britain. Now, let's explore history together. Welcome to this week's episode of British History, Royals, Rebels, and Romantics. Today we'll be visiting one of the most famous residences and tourist destinations in the world, Buckingham Palace. Let's take a look at some of the most frequently asked questions. We're starting with size. How big is Buckingham Palace? Buckingham Palace is, to put it simply, huge. Including the gardens, Buckingham Palace spans more than 35 acres. That's more than a million and a half square feet. The front of the palace alone is 355 feet across. The palace has more than 830,000 square feet of floor space. That makes it almost 15 times larger than the White House. Buckingham Palace is the largest palace in Great Britain and, according to the experts, the 14th largest palace in the world. There are 40 acres of gardens, including the largest private garden in London. The lake is three acres, and the famous herbaceous border is more than 500 feet long and nearly 17 feet deep. Typically, the Queen holds garden parties at Buckingham Palace every year. More than 30,000 guests are, attend these parties. They are able to wander around just a bit to explore the gardens. The garden is home to 30 different species of birds, 322 types of British wildflowers, and 150 mature trees. It's estimated that one-fourth of the entire type of British butterflies live in the garden. The garden at Buckingham Palace is also the location of the oldest helicopter pad in London. Now, how many rooms are there and what are they used for? There are 775 rooms in the palace, including 188 staff bedrooms to house many of the 400 people who work there. In addition, there are 52 bedrooms for members of the royal family and special guests. There are also 19 staterooms for important ceremonies and gatherings, a post office, a swimming pool, a doctor's office, a jeweler's workshop, and an ATM. Oh, and here's an important detail. There are 78 bathrooms. The biggest room in Buckingham Palace is the ballroom, which is 120 feet long, 59 feet wide, and more than 42 feet high. The ballroom was open in 1856 during the reign of Queen Victoria. The first ball held there was a celebration of the end of the Crimean War. Electricity was first installed in the ballroom in 1883. The main west block facing the gardens is where you'll find the staterooms. They are used for court ceremonies and official entertainments. Several of the staterooms were used fairly recently for the royal wedding reception of the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, including the picture gallery, the center room, the green drawing room, the white drawing room, the music room, the bow room, the ball room, the ball supper room, and the throne room. If you weren't lucky enough to score an invitation, you can see images of many of these rooms on the Royal website and the website of the Royal Collection Trust. I'll include links to these in the show notes. The royal family actually do live in the palace for parts of the year. The Queen and Duke of Edinburgh have a suite of apartments on the north side of the palace. The upper rooms on the north and east sides are where other members of the royal family live when they stay at the palace. Visiting dignitaries stay in guest rooms throughout the palace. Buckingham Palace is one of the few remaining working palaces in the world today. Much of the ground floor and the south wing is used by household officials. Here are just a few palace chores. There are now 40,000 light bulbs in the palace, and each must be monitored and quickly replaced when it burns out. The palace has 1,514 doors and 670 windows that are cleaned every six weeks. There are more than 350 clocks and watches, which is one of the largest collections of working clocks anywhere in the world, 
two staff members attend exclusively to clocks and watches to keep them in good working order. So it is a working palace indeed. Now, has Buckingham Palace always been the royal family's home? No, Buckingham Palace has not always been the royal family's home. In fact, it hasn't even always been owned by the royal family. Henry VIII acquired the Hospital of St. James, which became St. James Palace, and the Manor of Ebury in the 1530s. This brought the site of Buckingham Palace into royal hands. There's a legend that James I wanted to plant a mulberry garden to rear silkworms on the land, but used the wrong kind of silkworms and had to abandon the plan. The land phased out of royal hands after James's reign. The next owner was Lord Goring, and the property became known as Goring House. That burned down in 1674. In 1698, John Sheffield, who later became the first Duke of Buckingham, acquired the lease of the land and built a house in 1703. That was known as Buckingham House. His illegitimate son, Sir Charles Sheffield, inherited the property and sold it to King George III in 1761. George planned to use the building as a private retreat for his wife, Queen Charlotte. He remodeled the structure beginning in 1762, and it became known as the Queen's House. An act of Parliament settled the property on Queen Charlotte in 1775, and 14 of her 15 children were born there. While not the official residence of the monarchy, during that time there are occasional references to Buckingham Palace. When George IV inherited the throne, he hired John Nash to create a large U-shaped structure with a French neoclassical design. George IV was born and grew up in Buckingham House, so he wanted that to be grand enough to be the official royal residence. The renovations included expanding the main section of the building, adding wings to the west, north, and south. There was a large enclosed court that included a triumphal arch, But the project was so expensive that when George IV died, Nash was dismissed and the project was abandoned. Although William IV, the next king, wasn't interested in living in Buckingham Palace, Parliament eventually voted to complete the furnishing and the interior refurbishment to use as the official royal home. Queen Victoria, the first British monarch to live in Buckingham Palace, moved in in 1837. The next year, she was the first sovereign to leave from the palace to travel to Westminster Abbey for her coronation, and Buckingham Palace has been the official royal residence ever since. What are some memorable moments at Buckingham Palace? Well, in 1883, electricity was installed in the ballroom, and it took four more years to install electricity in the rest of the house. In 1841, Edward VII was born in Buckingham Palace, the first monarch to be born there. In 1910, he became the first monarch to die in Buckingham Palace, and he is still the only monarch to be born and die in Buckingham Palace. In 1914, suffragettes marched on the palace. They were led by Emmeline Pankhurst, who stated her intention was to deliver a petition to King George V. The newspaper described the event as, quote, a serious fracas between the wild women and the police, end quote. In World War II, Buckingham Palace became a symbol of battle and then celebration. The palace received nine direct bomb hits during the war. In 1940, the chapel was destroyed. The queen responded, I'm glad we have been bombed. Now we can look the east end in the eye. When the war was over, the palace played a very different role, as the royal family and prime minister appeared several times to join the cheering crowd in celebration. In 1965, Buckingham Palace became a center of popular culture. That year, the Beatles visited Buckingham Palace to receive their member of the British Empire medals from the Queen. John Lennon later claimed that the Beatles smoked weed in the palace, but George Harrison said it was just an ordinary cigarette. The Beatles aren't the only ones to reportedly misbehave at Buckingham Palace. Baby Spice stole a sign for the ladies' room. Olivia Coleman says her husband stole a roll of toilet paper. And Stephen Fry said he did cocaine on a visit to the palace. Scandalous. As the longest reigning monarch in British history, Queen Elizabeth has celebrated several jubilees at Buckingham Palace. The party at the palace in 2002 was a British concert and celebration held over Jubilee weekend, June 1 through 4. A ticket lottery selected the 12,000 people who attended, with about a million more watching along the mall and around the Queen Victoria Memorial. 
The performances included many hit songs from the Queen's reign, beginning with Brian May performing God Save the Queen on the roof of the palace with support from the orchestra down below in the garden. Brian May later said that he wanted to strike his last chord at the same moment as the orchestra playing below him, and he did. The concert also included performances from Phil Collins, Eric Clapton, Sir Elton John, and Sir Paul McCartney. Ten years later, Britain celebrated the Queen's Diamond Jubilee in early 2012. A concert was held outside the palace on the mall. The artist performed on a canopied stage constructed around the Queen Victoria Memorial. More than 1.2 million applications were received for the 10,000 available free tickets. Guest artists include Cliff Richard, Alfie Bowe, Grace Jones, Ed Sheeran, Annie Lennox, Renee Fleming, Shirley Bassey, Tom Jones, Stevie Wonder, Sir Elton John, and Sir Paul McCartney. After a speech from Prince Charles, the crowd joined in singing God Save the Queen, and there was a fireworks display featuring patriotic music. I wonder what Queen Victoria would have thought about her new royal palace becoming the site of drugs and two large and loud rock concerts. So who gets to be on the balcony? The first recorded royal appearance on the balcony happened in 1851 when Queen, Queen Victoria came out to greet the crowds that were gathering to celebrate the opening of the Great Exhibition. Seven years later, crowds again gathered at Buckingham Palace, this time to celebrate the wedding of Princess Victoria. The family appeared on the balcony again, and the tradition became firm, firmly established. Since Victoria's reign, royal balcony appearances have marked important events in the monarchy, one significant appearance was the celebration of the coronation of George VI. This came after the abdication of Edward VIII. In a recent documentary, Queen Elizabeth read her description of the event, which she experienced as an 11-year-old princess. About the balcony, she wrote, quote, Then we all went out to the balcony where millions were waiting below. End quote. The millions of people were rewarded for their waiting with a full view of the royal family. Not only were the new king and queen there, but also the two young princesses and the king's mother, Queen Mary. This gave the British people exactly the image the royals intended, continuation of the monarchy from the stately Queen Mary to the two little girls waving, waving and smiling. The monarchy was secure. The celebrations marking the end of World War II also drew the family up, out onto the balcony. Often accompanied by Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill, the family appeared eight different times throughout the day. During the final appearance, Princesses Elizabeth and Margaret slipped out into the crowd to join the celebration. According to an article in Smithsonian Magazine, the princesses were surrounded by an entourage of 16 people. Princess Elizabeth dressed in her auxiliary territorial service uniform and was terrified of being recognized. The girls were delighted to see their parents appear on the balcony, for once viewing the event as part of the crowd. The Queen later described the event as, quote, one of the most memorable nights of my life. The Queen has appeared on the balcony many times. She and Prince Philip appeared after their wedding in 1947 as part of the Queen's coronation in 1953 and numerous Trooping of the Color and other weddings. Speaking of weddings, recently those have provided many highlights on the balcony. In 1981, Prince Charles married Lady Diana Spencer and millions joined in the celebration. The throngs gathered at Buckingham Palace and shouted that the couple should kiss. Eventually they did, starting a new tradition of couples sharing a kiss on the balcony. This tradition was carried out enthusiastically, enthusiastically by Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson in 1986. Recently, Prince William carried on the tradition set by his parents by kissing his new bride, Catherine Middleton when they appeared on the balcony after their wedding in 2011. There are no hard and fast rules about who gets to appear on the balcony, as each event has different participants. Generally speaking, here's who is typically there. The monarch and the spouse, although health dictates appearances, and Prince Philip has not appeared recently. And the first and second in line to the throne. The monarch typically stands at the center of the group, except at royal weddings where the couple will take center stage. For most occasions, the Queen, Prince Charles and the Duchess of Cornwall, and the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge will be at the center of the group. For some events, other royal family members are invited. For the Queen's 90th birthday in 2016, more than 40 members of the royal family squeezed out to appear on the balcony. What about the future of Buckingham Palace? The vast and imposing palace so familiar to all of us 
might not be the most comfortable place to live. In April 2017, unsafe cabling was removed. Bits of masonry regularly fall off the building's facade. In 2007, one nearly hit Princess Anne. After a rodent problem in 2001, the official statement released was, the ratio of mice to men is very low. Seriously, that's the best you can do? Ratio is very low? The palace is currently undergoing extensive and expensive renovation with a projected cost of more than 369 million pounds or $480 million. These renovations will continue at least through 2025 when the queen will be asked to move out of her royal apartments. So what's the future of the palace? There are reports that Prince Charles doesn't feel the palace is worth the financial and environmental costs as a home in the modern world. There may be a new model for the palace envisioned in the future, with portions of Buckingham Palace being open for up to six months of the year and the state rooms being saved for special occasions. Buckingham Palace has reflected and shaped the royal family since Queen Victoria moved in in 1837, nearly 200 years ago. Official statements from the offices of Prince Charles and Prince William give no real indication of what to look for. But it seems clear we can look for more changes, celebrations, and special events at Buckingham Palace for years to come. Thank you for joining me for a virtual visit through the history of Buckingham Palace. Join us next time as we examine 15 fascinating facts about the first folio. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please share with a friend. Do send any questions or comments. I'd love to hear from you where we should explore next. And please subscribe and leave a review. I'd really appreciate it. I'm so glad we could explore history together. Till next time. (music) 